My guest today is Jeff Fritz. Jeff, how are you? Hey, doing all right, Dave. Good to see you. Uh, I'm feeling good, Social too. distancing. Social distancing. This is, uh, you know, I used to have a policy that I would only record technology and friends interview face-to-face, but the world changed, changed very suddenly. It did. And so yeah. I wanted to keep the show going, and so I reached out to my old friend Jeff here, and uh, this is, I think, the sixth time that you've been on my show. Six. Just counting. Oh my gosh! Let me go verify that. I'm going to walk over here. You're on episode 454, 538, 266, 221, and 351. That is, uh, first time was in 2012, I think. Okay. And uh, and then last time was about 18 months ago. And you were, uh, we were in Orlando, and you were talking about this new thing you were doing. You were starting a Twitch channel, and you were going to do live coding on screen. Yeah. And uh, I heard a rumor that you have now over 10,000 Twitch followers. I do. True? Yeah, yeah. That, that was that's it. Amazing. That's It's one of those milestone numbers, right? Whenever you add a zero to the end of a social network collection uh-huh. of folks that you're, you're speaking to, you're interacting with, th- that's a big milestone, right? Absolutely. Um, and... Uh, Folks have this real challenge with with Twitch and and breaking through those milestones because getting viewers, getting followers on Twitch is, um, it, folks think it's a little bit of a commitment and and it really isn't right. You're you're asking for notifications when folks go live. You're, you're showing your support by adding that follow. It's a little heart you click at the top of the thing, at, at the top of the user interface and. Um, it's great. It shows that there's a lot of folks that are interested in learning about technology on Twitch. So uh, I was flattered when we hit that number. That's pretty cool. So it sounds like you're not just uh, shouting out to the atmosphere and uh, hoping people will listen. You're actually building a community. Oh yeah, yeah. There's we're not we're not in a cave. We're not in, in some sort of uh, echo chamber here. There's there's definitely a community. There's a, a lot of folks out there that are also broadcasting, talking about technology on Twitch. They're, um, they're, they're trying to make a difference so that people can learn about all these different software techniques that, that we've learned, you know, many, many years ago. And, we, and we've been spreading, we've been teaching folks about, but to hear and see other folks that are, they're giving those tips about here's how to make a game. Here's some really cool things about building building a racing game. My friend Tim works on in the mornings, and and my friend Lana builds these first person games that are that are all film noir style. Really neat stuff Very that cool. folks like us wouldn't have had access to at a mm-hmm. at a conference or you know our typical day to day businessy type development. So it's neat to see the way other folks do stuff. I agree. And you're uh, when you're going on there, you're actually live coding, and you're learning about Blazor, right? And you're teaching other people about it while you, as you learn. Yeah. So for the past three, four months, we've been focused on Blazor on my stream, and the the goal there being, let's learn how we can take advantage of this new framework that is now fully supported as of ASP.NET Core three one that was released back in November, December. So you have four years of support available to you. Well, why not take advantage of that? Learn how we can build components. Learn how we can build interesting applications and make those available to folks and figure out then, as we look at this component-based architecture, are there ways that we can make it easier for folks to migrate to Blazor? And that's that's always a real challenge for anybody who's working with existing applications. How do I get here? My, my boss isn't going to just give me, you know, uh, open PO for fifty grand to spend time to go and build a new version of the application. So how do we migrate? How do we take what we already have and get there? And you know what? There's some pretty interesting answers to those questions. I, I want to hear them, but first, tell me, give us a definition of Blazor. What is it? Sure. So Blazor is the .NET team's um, new component-based architecture that you can use to build web applications. Um, And now there's experiments so you can build desktop applications and mobile applications. So using that same component-based architecture that we know and love from Windows Forms, WPF, ASP.NET Web Forms, you you can use a similar approach, build for those types of applications, and it not only will run 
on a server for a web application, you can run it in the browser using a technology called WebAssembly. Hmm. So uh, I've always thought of Blazor is mostly for web applications, but you mentioned some other things, some mobile applications and so on. Is that, is that uh, right out of the box that you get that? So those are, like I said, those are experiments. Right now, and oh, okay. the, the production-supported versions of Blazor are all web applications. Okay. So, and, it's, and we call it Blazor server-side because it will take those components, render them into HTML on a server, on a web server, mm -hmm. and use SignalR, that live communication technology, to be able to traffic back and forth to the client, to the web browser, the, the changes in those components that have happened on the server. So as you interact with the components, you click around in your web browser, it sends messages back to the server, and using SignalR, it sends a quick update that says, repaint the user interface with these changes. Okay, Real I get it. So, yeah. so, so, there's, so the browser has HTML, and there's a whole DOM built inside of the browser with those controls, but then that is echoed back on the server. as a similar DOM or a similar exactly. object model on the server, yep. and they're, they're sort of kept in sync through SignalR messages. You got it. Okay. Yep. Um, that makes sense to me. Right. Now, yeah. those experiments that are being done are, are looking at, well, can we take this same component architecture that works really great for web pages? And honestly, folks are already doing a little bit of work with Electron apps, right? Those, those applications that are really just the Chromium browser engine and embedding Node and JavaScript in it. Folks already do that, right? That's what Visual Studio Code is, right? It's effectively right. a browser hosting a bunch of HTML and JavaScript. Well, what if we could do that with Blazor and use this same technology to build WebAssembly apps that run inside of a Chromium browser and host it as a desktop application? Hmm. Now that gets interesting. Now, we figured out some ways as a team to short-circuit that and make better use of memory, but there's a possibility there. There's interesting developments there that the team is experimenting with and wants to figure out, is is this a compelling way to build desktop applications? Because there's lots of folks out there that know how to build web applications. If we can build desktop applications using those techniques, well, now everybody's on the same bar then for building applications. Very, yeah. very interesting. And we could reuse the same code and deploy it, it to multiple places. Yep. Uh, what's that? These, this is all in preview then, right? The, that, they're, the, not, they're not even... Described. Yeah, they're not even previewed. They're experiments. They're What's here's the something. So the difference being, experiments are the team not even committing to shipping something. The team not committing to a set of features yet, but throwing out nightly builds, throwing out periodic builds to test out and figure out do these features work. It's a huh. smaller group of developers that are working on that product and just testing to see. Are these compelling things that developers would use? And, of course, you've got enthusiastic folks that, that look at any new technology. They want to poke it. They want to give it a try. They want to see how valuable it is. Sounds like it is. you. Maybe, a little bit. <laughs> I'm not going to deny. <laughs> but you want to, right? Everybody likes to try out the new shiny thing. Sure. Does this does this work? Does it fit my needs? And And they're getting some great feedback on that and trying to figure out, okay, well, what does the next step of this mean where it could become a real product? It could become a real framework so that we can have great portability of these applications. Because when you think about it, an, a desktop application that's built with web technologies on a portable browser-like platform like Electron is real easy to ship, not just for Windows, but have the same code work on Mac and Linux. Hmm. Now it gets interesting. Now we've got that cross-platform feature set that might be really compelling, not just for .NET developers, but for any developer. The Mac we'll Linux story is really interesting. Yeah, but it's an experiment. Let's let's see if this makes sense to folks. And if okay. it does, we'll continue investing and continue building. If it doesn't, and the data shows that folks aren't interested, okay, well, we'll go figure out something else. All right. Well, we'll get too excited about it yet. But it does sound pretty darn cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier about migrating from a classic web forms application into Blazor. What does that process look like? Sure. So, right, this is this is that thing that web forms developers have struggled with going all the way back to MVC. 
the, how do we get from web forms to the next framework? If we want support, if we want to try those new things, how do we get from web forms to framework X, right? And going web forms to MVC, well, there were people that figured out how to bring in MVC in parts of your web server and copy and paste things over. And you ended up rewriting your application. Yeah, because, which can be really expensive. Oh, my gosh, you're right. So that that wasn't something too palatable for folks. And and when we talk about ASP.NET Core, well, ASP.NET Core is only MVC. They didn't bring web forms over there as a user interface framework. So so how do we do that? Well, that's going to run into that same issue that you had with getting into MVC. So, okay, what's the next step? Where, where do we go from there? Well, as Blazor comes along, and Blazor has at least the same architecture concept of component-based user interface that has events, and granted it only has two events instead of four, um, we might be able to do something with that. We might be able to lean in a little bit there because we'll have components in Blazor that do similar things to what we had in web forms, right? Okay. We, we certainly have all of our input components. We have, uh, we can build repeaters and things so you can build grids and whatnot. Well, that's nice and, and that gives us a direction to go, but we need to get all of our code migrated. So folks end up taking code that's written into working with their web forms, pulling it out into a class library, make that class library work with the new .NET standard technology, right? .NET standard is that contract that says this code will work on versions of .NET X, Y, and Z, right? So I can say this works on, works on .NET standard 2, and it's portable then to work on .NET Core, Xamarin, and other places that .NET framework is also supported as well. So if we get all of our logic over into class libraries and .NET standard, then we can focus on our user interface. So what if we can take our user interface and get those ASPX files, those ASCX files, the user controls as well, and get them into Blazor components or Blazor pages using similar markup? Right, and th there were some efforts to try and get similar markup into those Blazor pages, into it, it, which are Razor templates. It's not even the same web forms markup, so you have to do a little bit of rewrite, and you can copy it over and get it there. But the more and more that that we started looking at this, um, the program manager for Blazor, Dan Roth, and I were talking about this, and and Dan said, "Wouldn't it be great if we had components that had the same name?" as their web forms counterparts and did almost the same thing give me an example so like okay a button, like a button or a uh, not box? just a button a button's too simple what about like a repeater right okay. you want to repeat the same block of html each time there's there's one of these items in a collection right you've got products in in your database that you want to list out on a page so you want to just have a repeater that right. has you know whatever that card is right you have html cards we output now right i just want to repeat those well what if we had a repeater component in blazor that behaved the same way hmm. and and i was like dan that that sounds doable right because we know what the markup looks like that's a, supposed to come out of those web forms controls if we make it look the same output the same in blazor that that makes portability easier that makes that conversion easier and if we even enable and uh support the same attributes and get the same markup out of it now you've now you've got a migration strategy because i could right i could take that repeater that was defined in web forms and if i can copy that over make a few slight changes just because it's not it's not web form syntax it's not the right less than percent syntax that you have in web forms but it's now razor we might be onto something we might be able to do this faster so we tinkered we came up with a proof of concept and we were able to reuse about 80 percent of our code with just that initial repeater control. All right, now we're talking. Now let's see what we can do with some of these other ones. And there's there's about 26 controls when you look at the base control set that ships with web forms, not including the data editor components, right? Things like an input box or a date com or a data date data entry field, right? But other things like a grid or a menu or a tree, those things 
there's a lot of those. Mm. What if what if we could start doing that? And we're about 15, 16 components in to making that minimal viable product. Just get the components running. Get them into read-only mode so that you can copy over your code and start to see it working. And it's it's really starting to look like a real thing. So we've, we're working on this live on Twitch as a open source project that we call Blazor Web Forms Components. Mm. And we're starting to see more and more folks say, this makes sense to me. This, this feels like the way for me to shortcut, to lower that on-ramp to get from Web Forms to Blazor, which also means not just Blazor, but .NET Core, which means you can put your web application in a container. You're not coupled to just IIS. Well, when it's in a container, right? We know when you're in a container, you can deploy that with with Kubernetes. You can put that out into all kinds of modern Azure architectures and take advantage of all kinds of modern web things that you're limited from being in web forms. Now we're talking. Now we've got an on-ramp that feels good. So that's where... I'm trying to push this project, and I think I think we're getting the right uptake here. That folks are seeing interest, and and we're growing in the right direction. Oh, I see. So, so you're talking to the Blazor product team, but it's yep. not the Blazor product team that's building this this these tools you're no. talking about. It's you and your ten thousand minions exactly. who on Twitch or who are actually building this, mm -hmm. publishing it out somewhere on GitHub or something. Yep, it, uh, it's out on GitHub. You can download the components from NuGet. So, if you want the binaries, they're out there on NuGet. You can download, install it into a clean Blazor project, and start okay. copying over markup, and getting the same experience from Blazor that you had in your web forms. That's pretty cool. Uh, so it is still a rewrite, to be clear, if you want to migrate it, from web forms to this, but you're easing that rewrite by providing exactly. some similar controls. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what about, uh, I remember it's been a long time since I've done any web forms development, but one of the big challenges <laughs> I had was the, there's an onload event, and there's an mm -hmm. on-render, and there's a pre-render mm -hmm. event. Is any of that uh, applicable? If I have code in those events, is that does that migrate well to, so, to Blazor? When you look at Blazor by itself, no, it doesn't. There, there's there's an on initialize and there's an on after render event. Well, okay. on load doesn't really map into those. Okay. So what we did, I, I like that there's only two. There were two. Yeah, many. right. <laughs> and even then, on after render renders many times. That 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 can happen For after each, each time you re-render the control. Oh, I see. Right? So think about if you have a control that has a button with a text box next to it and you push the button and it increments a number in that text box. Each time that it renders a new number in that text box, the after render event is triggered. I see. So interesting things could happen there, right? Are you thinking about a calculator app? Each time you press a button on the calculator, it re renders that text box at the top mm -hmm. that has whatever sum that you've put in there, right? Right. So. What if we could put together a shim that emulates those events and places them appropriately and handles them appropriately inside and remaps them into the two events in Blazor? And we've started down that path of, well, maybe we can emulate this so that we can get a little bit past just copying over your markup and be able to give you a place to land exactly like you're saying, Dave. Some of those, some of that code that you wrote in onload bring it down in here, fix a couple of the references, and you might be able to get away with less, significantly less, code rewriting because you just copied it over. Hmm. That's interesting. That would be interesting. It sounds like a bigger challenge than the repeater part. Exactly. To, right? Uh, for, without ever looking at the code. That's my gut oh, feeling. Oh, and, and gosh, Dave, how many folks complain about view state in... In oh, web forms. Another big challenge in web forms. Oh, my gosh. So when you think about what, what view state is, it's just a storage location that you're putting things to remember so that when you come back later in the life cycle of your web form, you want to get it back out of there so you can reuse it, right? It's right. it's hold on to this till I come back and need it. Don't don't modify it. Just hang on to this. Mm -hmm. Well, what if, what if we just put together a shim for view state that is a string object dictionary? I've got just these objects I'm putting out there. It's being stored in memory, just like Blazor does. It's storing it in a Blazor-specific way, instead of the old web formsy way of serializing all that goo into your so HTML. So we don't have this uh, 
four-page string of uh, gobbledygook no. that has to get po posted every single time the form is resubmitted? Exactly. Don't do that. But let's still make that API to us as programmers available and store our data in a responsible, Blazor-appropriate way. Fantastic. So we've got that also. We have we support view state for those folks that took advantage of storing things in view state. That's pretty cool. I think uh, as you're talking about this, it, it seems like it would be a lot easier to migrate a project from web forms to Blazor if you took the time to uh, put things into class libraries when you were building your web forms application, as opposed to putting everything into the on load or the on render events. Uh, that that would make migration a whole lot easier and a whole lot cleaner if you were to run these tools that you're talking about. Absolutely. You, you, you're, you're preaching to the choir, my friend. And the, the good news is, though, you can do some of that refactoring in your existing apps, right? They, that doesn't break anything to move things into a class library and make that class library.net standard. Maybe that would be good step one before you exactly. start migrating yep. with the tools you've so built. So get it nudged over there. Your application still works, and you can start pulling that class library that has your business logic that was wired up, you can start pulling that now into your new Blazor application. There's an opportunity. That's so, really cool. Wh where is this yeah. project located? So, this, so the project source code is out on GitHub. If you go to github.com slash Fritz and Friends slash Blazor Web Forms Components, you'll see where we're working on it right now. Fritz and Friends. By the way, is that a Fritz and Friends chair you're sitting in right now? This? Yes, it is. <laughs> the back of it has the I saw it on social media on. with mm. your logo. That's very cool. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and I, this is an ongoing. You're still you're continuing to work on this, right? Um, we are continuing to work on it. It's something people that want to join in. They want to help out. They go to your Twitch channel, which is where. Uh, Twitch channel's real easy to find. Twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. Just like all my other social medias. All right, and the, and you're beating. You have a pretty regular cadence, right? You're, like, I do. Every day at X o'clock. Um, four days a week, Tuesday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, 1400 UTC while we're here in summertime in, in the United States, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and I'm also on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. as well. That is awesome. And I think I read something that you're doing some sort of all-day event coming up. Is that right? So I've, I've got a couple of, event, of events coming up. Um, on April 9th, we've got a live uh, we've got a live conference that we're doing, a virtual conference that we're doing on Twitch. Um, 14 members of my stream team, other folks that, that are coding live on Twitch, we're going to be giving presentations live. Um, you can find that at uh, conf.livecoders.dev. And because we hit those 10,000 followers, I'm scheduling a 12-hour stream. 12 hours to talk to, talk to viewers. Uh, talk to interview some folks, write some code together live, and we're going to do that middle later in April. Um, and we've got some other fun things planned for May, maybe even into June. We'll see. Well, that was awesome. I, I actually had a chance to be on your show, and you got to ask me a few questions about a week ago, and I had a blast. It was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciated you uh, joining me that day. Yeah, and I appreciate you joining me this day. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we head out? Um, I would say something about how my Philadelphia Flyers are doing better than the Chicago Blackhawks, but they haven't lost a game in weeks. I know. Can you believe this? <laughs> Undefeated in weeks here. <laughs> okay, that's not a thing. <laughs> Jeff, thanks so much. Appreciate All right, your time. good seeing you, Dave. <laughs> Hey there, my name is Jeff Fritz, and I am social distancing from my technology and my friends.